and you're living your life, and then all of a sudden you're out there helping cops solve crimes. ABC Tuesdays. I have an IQ of 160. I spot things that detectives miss. Fall's most anticipated drama is all new, High Potential. That big brain of hers is going to help us close out a lot of cases. Caitlin Olsen is the new face of investigation. You're a single mom pretending to be a cop. I am not pretending. I'm just out here super copping. High Potential. All new Tuesdays, 10, 9 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With their game-changing FlexPath format, you can earn your degree on your schedule so you can fit education seamlessly into your life. Imagina tu futuro de otra manera en capella.edu. You can support this podcast at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. I'm Rebecca Lavoy, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts. And on this episode, the evidence that a group of Marines committed war crimes in an Iraqi village was convincing. So why was no one held accountable by the military? We'll resume our discussion of the final four episodes of In the Dark, Season 3. Joining me to get that done and more is true crime author, TV journalist, and host of These Are Their Stories podcast, my husband and love of my life, Kevin Flynn. Hello, Kevin. Hello, Rebecca. Also with us is private investigator, certified pet detective, that's a real title, resident cat lady, and author of the Piper Green series of cozy mysteries, Laura Bricker. Hi, Laura. Hey, Rebecca. Yeah, I had a lot of people reach out to me after that presidential debate because I was a cat detective mm-hmm. thinking I had some new job prospects. Yes. So About that's missing me. eating cats. <laughs> and we should say our friend Amber Hunt, who reports for the Cincinnati Inquirer, has unfortunately had to spend way too much of her time debunking the ridiculous and racist lies about Haitian immigrants eating people's pets. But clearly it's not true. Springfield, Ohio um, is not a place where that is happening. And the like one story where someone did kill somebody's cat not in Springfield and not Haitian, but Amber Hunt uh, has been. Um, and otherwise, it checks completely Check, out. Completely checks out. Yes, but it Am- was seen on television, so yes, it must be true. Uh, but Amber Hunt, our, our wonderful friend, has done a ton, ton of reporting on it. And she has linked to other people's reporting on it, and you can follow her on Twitter at reporter Amber to check out all of those stories. If a tiny part of you is curious as to whether or not any part of that story is true. There are real journalists doing fact checks on that. I know this is like a week later for folks listening to this, but I would just say that if you're talking about eating dogs and cats, you are off message. (laughs) And finally, our resident doubting Thomas, author of the City Trilogy of Novels, host of Rip Current, Strange Arrivals, and our Patreon Deep Dive Book Club podcast host, Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. Hey, Rebecca. So, Toby, Rip Current... What is happening on the current episode uh, now out of Rip Current? Rip Current episode three is dropping today, too. If you wondered what Lynette Squeaky Fromm was doing between the time Charles Manson went to prison and she tried to kill President Ford, it was some weird stuff. And that is the subject of episode three of Rip Current. Can't wait to hear that one, Toby. Yeah. Actually, if you're on iHeart True Crime Plus, then you've got episode four, a week early and ad free. Mm. It's about this crazy scheme that Lynette Fromm and her friend Sandra Good had to assassinate CEOs of companies that they thought were harming the earth. So they were sending around letters from the International Court of Retribution saying they were going to send assassins after all these rich people. And that's just a very small part of uh, episode four. Wow. I have a question. At some point, are you and your co-host going to break into song from the musical Assassins? Yes or no? Uh, You clearly have not listened to uh, (laughs) episode even one. I well, I have heard I have heard the Assassin's song in episodes one, but are you going to do it together? We are not going to do it together as of now. There may be a special bonus episode at the end where we do a uh, a table read. Of all the right. entire <laughs> play, Assassins. I sing all the male parts, okay, which oh, is eighty percent of it, okay. But I don't want to promise anything. All right, oh, good to know. Good to know. All right, so Kevin, mm-hmm. uh, what is coming up on next Monday's Crime Writers on? So on uh, Monday, we're going to talk about the new podcast, Doc. 
Mr. Miracle. All right. And then, wait, isn't the host of that podcast someone we've reviewed before? Yeah. Did you uh, remember listening to Devil in the Ditch? One of my favorite podcasts. I do. And that's Laris and Campbell, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. And this is a new Laris and Campbell podcast. Correct. Dr. Miracle. Okay. So, Kevin, there's one other thing that you wanted to discuss real quickly, right? Yeah. I just want to let people know again that this year I will be walking a mile uh, in their shoes. It's the Walk a Mile, and I'm raising money for the Crisis Center of Central New Hampshire. And it's a special theme this year. Eras, it's a Taylor Swift theme, so I have to, like, not just get high heel shoes to raise money. I have to, like, somehow Taylor Swift this up. Yes. Maybe I'm a Jason Kelsey. I don't know. Travis, you mean? I'm definitely not Travis. <laughs> that would be uh, a weird, <laughs> be a weird I'm a, move to be the brother-in-law. I'm a Kelsey. I'm a Kelsey cousin. Yeah. yeah. Why don't you just be an era? I, what era would I Reputation. be? Reputation. I don't think, I'm probably, like... A tortured folk? poet. Are you I'm a be tortured a, poet. A tortured poet to be. I, good I do have a typewriter, you. so that's it. But who uses if, typewriters anyway, Kevin? You do. Oh, I got a blank space, oh, yes. and I will. I will write your name if you donate, and uh, I am so on proud a future of you right episode now. of yes. Crime Writers on, I'll give a quick rundown and thank everybody who donated. And uh, if you'd like to donate, you can do so by going to the link in the show notes of this episode. I am so proud of you. It's October 2nd, so we can't waste time. We got to get it going. Kevin, I'm so proud of you. You know why? Why? Just a couple weeks ago, you said to me, haven't I been so saintly putting up with your Taylor Swift era? Yeah. And you've been (laughs) been absorbing it. You've been absorbing it. So not only have you been saintly, you've been paying attention. I've internalized the trauma. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. You mean you've internalized I'm just all kidding. of her trauma? <laughs> no, no. I am all into uh, childless cat ladies, uh, especially the famous ones. So, all right. Yep. All right. Okay. Well, it's time to talk about what we're talking about. And it is a doozy. So should we get that going? Do it. Okay. Let's go ahead and drop that first clip now. Leading off. Hello. Hello. What's up? I. We have the photos. We have all the photos. Oh my gosh. Okay. This is a very big deal. When we last listened to season three of In the Dark, Madeline Barron had collected signatures from the families of the Haditha victims, hoping to obtain secret photographs of the massacre. In the final episodes of the season, the team gives the pictures to an analyst who says the images are clear evidence of a war crime. This is an up close and personal shot where you're putting a a bullet into a little boy. Like he was shot from like one side of his head to the other. He was executed from the back right to the front left temple while his face was down in a kneeling position. Military prosecutors eventually charged eight Marines for killing two dozen unarmed Iraqi men, women and children. But a cascade of immunity offers intervention by commanding officers and a generous plea bargain meant no one was held accountable for the murders in any meaningful way. To me, what can I have done better? Um, Because, you know, I was the one that for all of lack of better term was a chosen one to be the the expert on this, you know, did I, did I mess up? And I don't know. The final episodes of In the Dark Season 3 probe what went wrong with the prosecution of the infantrymen who rounded up and slaughtered civilians in retaliation for an IED attack. And while the number of victims in Haditha have been listed as 24, Barron and her team find evidence the number is too low. Spoiler alert, we are going to be talking about very significant plot points from the final four episodes of In the Dark. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes for our thumbs up or thumbs down review. So, Toby, in episode six of In the Dark, we find out the photos have been obtained. Did you have any doubt that this team was going to be able to get these photos uh, when you started listening to this podcast? Not really. I mean, once they started mentioning it, you like figured they were going to come up eventually, you know, both the quality of the reporters and then also the fact that they're talking about it, I thought was going to lead to it. What I didn't quite anticipate was when they start just describing the photos, I was like, oh boy, I don't know how this is going to turn out. But it was actually super riveting, I would say. And in fact, like you can see the photos now in the New Yorker and NewYorker.com, which I saw, but in some ways... Even the description of them were more impactful because when you see them, 
they're super, super disturbing, but they're not just because they're so normal, except that the people in them have been killed. Right. But they're just like in these rooms and, and like, there's nothing else to indicate that there would be violence other than the bodies. And I think we've gotten so used to sort of these iconic pictures that we associate with war crimes or sort of malfeasance on the part of our military. And I think about the picture from Abu Ghraib of that woman with her thumbs up pointing at the prisoners or the prisoner who's standing on the crate with his hands out and a hood over his head. Like these are kind of iconic photos. The photos that are in this are not like that at all. And that's sort of the power of them is that they aren't. But then the description of them I think they make decisions in how they describe them that when you're just looking at the photo without context or whatever, it may not necessarily come through automatically. So it's almost like they're guiding you as to how to interpret these photos, which I thought was really like sort of shockingly effective and kind of leaves you kind of emotionally drained uh, just because of the facts of what happened and then them describing the images that were left that they were able to get. There's a mom on her back, lying dead on the bed. Mm -hmm. And then all of her dead children around her. And there's a little boy who's like curled up next to his mom. You can see how he's like, kind of has his arm on his mom's stomach. Yeah, and he's just like burrowing into the blanket. It was so difficult because, you know, full transparency, we all had heard episode six in our last review of In the Dark. Uh, It was so difficult to not talk about it then. I have listened to this episode four times now. I listened to it three times then. I've listened to it four times now. This episode, episode six, is riveting. That's exactly the right word, Toby. They are, by the way, think about the trick of this. This is a piece of audio. Whatever doubts I may have had about someone's ability to look at a picture and say, oh, that was definitely a crime. Like, I understood it because I had heard the description of it. It was a riveting episode. It was a difficult episode, but I was able to listen to it four times. I went back and listened to it again, and I wanted to listen to it again because it was that good. Now that we've seen some of the photographs and selections that The New Yorker posted online, Even the least explicit ones are just very gruesome. And it's certainly why these photographs are important, two things, because truly without this as evidence, they very easily could have passed this off as something else. One of the photographs, probably the least explicit photograph in that list is one where there is a bloody or bloody drag marks down the hallway out the door, which when we hear they took the bodies out and that's very different to come across a pile of dead people versus seeing them in a bedroom with their arms around each other. But you know, that tells a completely different story. And Toby's right, because I can't imagine Abu Ghraib without those photographs. If it was just a newspaper article that detainees were being abused, it doesn't have the same legs. And so there was already a lot of pressure about Haditha. Even the president was like, we need to get to the bottom of this. But if those photographs had been out, it would have like just added rocket fuel to this and it would not have faded the way that it did. So, Laura, um, episode six is also when we hear about Tatum, right? And I know you have thoughts about this particular Marine. Yeah, just listening to the unfolding story of Corporal Tatum, my head started to kind of explode like, that, that sort of injustice, rage part of my personality just started to bubble up because he starts off with these very vague statements about like what he did or didn't do or did or didn't know about what happened. And then he, you know, eventually tells NCIS that he was one of the shooters. But he says, oh, well, I didn't know who was shooting. It was just firing at targets. But then as the story continues, then he admits that he knows that they were shooting women and children. Tatum told investigators that in the first house, Abdul Rahman's house, inside the living room, he personally had shot four people, all on the right side of the room. He said he knew he was shooting women and children in that room. He said he hadn't seen any weapons on any of them, and that none of the people were even standing up when he shot them. Tatum told NCIS that he only stopped shooting after everything in the room stopped moving. Hearing that, I was just like, how? Nobody was held criminally 
liable for this. And the way that the justice process played out here is to me still mind boggling when you hear details like this. And I thought it was also really well done that after this part with Tatum, then Madeline's like, at the risk of sounding obvious, it is illegal to kill children. It is a war crime. Yeah. And you're like, the fact that she has to say that out loud and put that in the script because of the way that this case was handled, I was like, head explodes. Okay, who is going to do something about this? What is going to happen here? Is somebody ever going to be held accountable? Unfortunately, I don't think so. But wow. And Laura, you were like me that you were really taken by the conversation with Tatum's civilian lawyer. Yeah. Where, you know, just kind of judging by the tone of her voice, she was kind of sympathetic to these victims, right? Mm -hmm. There was a kind of warmth about the lawyer that kind of like you read through the fact that, you know, this person knows professionally what they need to do, but is troubled by what happened, including, like, you know, the, the defense lawyer that we hear from the trial later on. But there was that one moment where she's reading the statement in their, their legal analysis that Tatum didn't break the law. And they push back and like, how is that not breaking the law? And she kind of paused and thought about it. And like, really, what you're hearing is like in her mind going, oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, yeah, you're right. That is kind of. Yeah, I don't see how can you not have killed a baby and like admitted to it. And that's not against any legal code. So I thought that was a, a very enlightening passage. In one of the houses, he shot at a child knowing it was a child. Um, and so I just wonder how you can reconcile that statement with the idea that he didn't do anything wrong. That's a totally fair question. Um, I'll have to go through my file and find the statement that you're talking about. The other part that was really enlightening was when they had that expert looking at those photos mm -hmm. and he's seen it all, been there, done that. And he like pauses for that extended period of time. I believe it was when that was the photo of the little boy that was like kind of behind something that had been shot yeah. and hearing his reaction sort of in real time, just like, you know, this is bad, but when you, when you hear that reaction from somebody that is that seasoned, who is used to seeing that level of crime scene photo, you're like, this is really fucking bad, really fucking bad. I've seen a lot of kids killed throughout my career. Um, it's not easy. But um, it just takes me back to all those experiences as well. Um, it, it's just, it's disgusting. It really is. There is so much tape like that in these episodes. And then and we'll, I want to talk about this in a little bit, uh, including one of the best pieces of tape I've ever heard of real-time reaction in, in any podcast ever. But first, I want to ask uh, Toby a question about some of the writing in these episodes. I was talking about this last night. I was at dinner with my son, and he hasn't heard the podcast yet. And the way that I just keep describing this, it is the most clean, matter-of-fact, precise, efficient, yet like impactful, even though I hate that word, writing of a story like this that could possibly be done. And there are so many turns of phrase that are like in the moment so clever without being cute that are so accurate and like get to the heart of exactly what they're trying to say. And you made a note of one of them in your notes when she talks about the story they tell, you know, about the the perfect terrorist cell of insurgents that this car dealer and this, you know, guy who worked for the police and this, you know, these four guys who were killed and they, they described them. How do they describe them, Toby? These four men that were killed with their four different professions? As the village people of the insurgency. Right. I, would have, I mean, a perfect piece of writing, right? It's like, it was incredible. What, what do you think of the, just the consistent writing of this team? Well, I was listening to it. I was thinking about how sort of fortunate, like, I don't know if the listeners are fortunate or Madeline or team are fortunate or the New Yorker is fortunate, but that that was what ended up happening is that her team started working for the New Yorker. Because it fits right in, right? It's excellent writing. It is that sort of understated yet impactful kind of writing, you know, it, it doesn't have to be like, you can do long investigations. You can cover things that are important that happened years ago. It's not like working for a newspaper or something like that, where sort of the imperatives are different. It's a good fit. It's a good fit for this team. Yeah. It's a really good fit. I mean, it's very consistent with, you know, their written stuff. 
So I, I guess that's, that, that was kind of my impression is that it, it, it felt very seamless as somebody who reads New Yorker a lot. It's like, yeah, of course, this is the audio equivalent of like a really great New Yorker story. And, and this is the kind of thing that the New Yorker would go after as well. Yeah, you got to know what lane you're in. Like for us at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. Yes. We've got all sorts of really great podcasts. I guess we're in the business section. Yeah. Laura Bricker, by the way, has this link uh, bookmarked yes. in her browser. Yes. So she knows exactly yes. where to go. She knows now. She knows now. I have it linked. It's up there. What's I can the link, go Laura? Do you want to re- repeat what that link is? Patreon.com slash partners in crime media. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Very mm-hmm. good. By the way, uh, if you you like us on Patreon, you should know that last month we had 21 episodes. Wow. 21 episodes that you can get just by joining us there and supporting us at one of several levels. And these levels... The New Yorker should hire the, us. We're they so, should. We're they so should. productive. But you patrons, what you're doing is you're supporting us. You're letting us continue to do these things and give you all this extra content. If you join us at the leading off level, you get great stuff like the Crime Writers on After Show, Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast, and our Married with Podcast Advice podcast. But if you come up a little higher at the Bricker scale level, for one dollar more a month, you'll also get Laura Bricker's Leave It to Bricker podcast. Podcast. And if you join us at the Let's Do What We Do level, you can get episodes of Crime Writers on early and ad free. You'd already know what our thumbs up or thumbs down review is for in the dark. Yes. Which I can, you probably could have. You can't guess. You can't guess. Thumbs down. Yeah. Four thumbs down. Four thumbs down. Or eight. We're all going eight thumbs down. Uh, and also, if you become one of the deep divers, not only can you get Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club podcast, but you can also watch when Toby records. And so you can see. What's going on before the audio podcast comes out? Toby's guests for the next deep dive are Ann Lucas, Nanita Cranford, and Kate Tuttle. And Toby, what book are you guys all talking about? We are talking about The Wager by David Gran, sort of adventure story of the British Navy back in the 1730s. And uh, Ann, uh, Nanita, and Kate were all British sailors, so they're bringing that context to it, no? Yeah, they've got personal experience with scurvy. And, scurvy, uh, yeah. yeah. You need a lime. Yeah, they'll have an uh, interesting perspective, having experienced all these things themselves. Hey, there are other ways that you can support us that are very easy. If you can't join us on Patreon, that's fine. But one of the things you could do is you could just stop by our Amazon shop before you do your Amazon shopping, right? We've got a couple of things there. If you like it, you can try some of our selections or you can just go on and do the rest of your shopping. Now, you can get there at Amazon.com slash shop slash Crime Writers On. Now, we also pick certain things. So, uh, so Rebecca, can you tell us what are your Amazon recommendations for this week. Okay, this is really stupid and frivolous, but I'm recommending it because it's totally aesthetic and totally something that people out there might appreciate. Mm -hmm. You know that ugly-ass Easy Pass hanging in your uh, windshield? Yep, for those states that have Easy Pass, yes. Do you know that you can get a super sleek black cover for it so that when you put it in the little tinted part of your windshield, it becomes completely invisible. Ooh. Do you know that? Sneaky. I ordered one of those and it is in my possession for when my new car finally arrives, if it ever arrives, even though I ordered it in fucking June and it was supposed to be here in eight weeks. I have that in my possession and I'm so excited to put it into use if my new car ever fucking gets here. Hey, Toby Ball, what are your listener inspired deep cut recommendations? I would never waste your time with anything that was either frivolous or stupid. (laughs) So we're starting right off with... uh, Bobo's Peanut Butter and Strawberry Jelly Oat Snack, 24 Count, Healthy Everyday Snack, a satisfying treat that provides a quick energy boost. A lot of those words are capitalized for some reason. (laughs) You're not reading them right. You have to be yelling them. Yeah, I was trying to, but it was just going to be one consistent scream. Uh, And here's another one. Silk Balance Hot Tub, (laughs) 76 ounces or 38 ounces Sick Balance Conditioner, with Grime Gripper for Silk Spa Spas, Mackey Product Guide for Hot Tubs and Spas Silk Balance. What is going on? Wow. Is it for a hot tub? I don't know. It, I was just reading words. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. All right. It's Thanks, a, it's Toby. A, it's a conditioner. It's a hot tub conditioner. Not for your hair. For Silk Spa Spas. I wonder why your hot tub needs to be conditioned. Because you don't want to get Legionnaire's disease, for fuck's sake, Laura. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. All right. 
So yeah, shop us first at Amazon.com slash Crime Writers on. We earn commissions on qualified purchases. Lastly, another way that you can help us out, and it doesn't cost you anything, engage with us on social media. We're there. If you see our posts, like our posts. Leave a comment. Just click on stuff. Let the algorithm know that we're there and you're engaged with us, and that helps get us out to more people. It's really super easy. It's all you got to do. It's it's the very least you can do. Also, changing your like, settings on iOS and Apple would be helpful, too. Yeah, there's that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, Kevin, before we end the business section, can I ask you a question? Mm-hmm. I ask it every Thursday. You know what it is. Do we have... Any Patreon patron saints of the week? That's right. Do yes. we have any? Who are they? Kim Hoffling... And Kelly Gardner. Nice. Bless you. Now, Kim, by the way, she was visiting in New Hampshire. Yes. We didn't know she was a friend of a friend. And yes. And came up and she ate Rebecca Lavoie cookies that had been donated. It just, it's a crazy what? story. She's a friend of Livy Burdett's parents. Yes. Oh, my. Yes. There are Rebecca Libby's? Lavoie cookies? Where, yeah. do, where do you get those? I made At the Patreon cookies. level, at the cookie level. Okay. I made cookies and I sent them home with Livy Burdett's parents after they had dinner at our house. And then the next day... They were doing like a party at their house and this woman was there and she was our fan and they were serving my cookies and she got to have one. Yeah. And she was like, I had the, what flavor cookies were they? They were the, um, the shortbread, they were the shortbread chocolate chip, chocolate chunk cookies from the New York Times, the salted chocolate chunk shortbread Mm. cookies that I have notes on how to make better than the recipe. Yeah. Oh. I actually say too much butter this time, but that's fine. Also, Kelly Gardner, she's, uh, she's listed as crazy dog lady. So she goes along with the crazy cat lady. So. All right. Okay. So, Kevin, does thus end our business section? Oh, thus ends the business section. I'm going to go ahead and fade that music out right now. Good taste is easy to spot, but hard to pin down. You know it when you see it. And in today's culture, there's no greater signifier of taste than the car you drive. You want something sophisticated, but not stodgy. Daring, yet classic. Approachable, but with an air of opulence. It may sound like a rare find because it is, and it perfectly describes the Range Rover Evoque. Drive a statement piece with pure presence. The Evoque is charisma in motion. This luxury SUV is artfully crafted and designed to stand out, and the reductive exterior is an elegant expression of Range Rover DNA. With clean lines, the minimalist design speaks for itself. The chiseled taillights give it a sense of motion, even at standstill. You'll find quality materials and solid craftsmanship at every turn. And you can curate your interior with a variety of distinct themes and trim finishes. It's an elevated drive for elevated lives. Explore the Range Rover Evoke at LandRoverUSA.com. Kevin, who's sponsoring us right now? Okay, uh, we're brought to you by Quince. Quince? Yeah, hey, like we're um, into fall right now and it's back to school. And so all those short shorts, tank tops, all those, you know, Cool linen clothes that yes. would be th- those are all going in the closet. You got to get ready for it's cashmere sweater time. It's cashmere. If you're gonna go out and get decorative gourds, yes, miniature decorative gourds, decorative gourd season. Yes, <laughs> that's right. You got to shift your wardrobe. Luckily, Quince offers timeless and high quality items that you'll adore, ensuring your wardrobe stays fresh and you don't blow your budget. And remember, all Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. Yes, they sure are. I love Quince so much, Kevin. Yeah. I was actually shopping on Quince like earlier today on my phone while I was mm-hmm. editing something. Mm-hmm. <sighs> There's something I want so badly. Tell me. It's a cashmere cardigan. Of course it is. It's so cute. But does it break the bank? No, of course it doesn't break Good the exa- bank. Then I'll allow it. Oh, I will. I will allow it. Thanks for allowing it. Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices, along with premium fabrics and finishes. How awesome is that? Make switching seasons a breeze with Quince's high-quality closet essentials, like a crop cashmere sweater. Go to mm. quince.com slash crime, crime for free shipping on your order and 365-day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash crime, crime to get free shipping and 365-day returns. Quince.com slash crime. crime. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With their game-changing FlexPath format, you can earn your degree on your schedule so you can fit education seamlessly into your life. Imagina tu futuro de otra manera en capella.edu. This episode is supported by FX's Grotesquerie, a new series from executive producer Ryan Murphy. Heinous crimes unsettle a small community, and the local detective feels these atrocities are eerily personal, as if someone or something is taunting her. 
Starring Nisi Nash Betts, Courtney B. Vance, Leslie Manville, and Travis Kelsey. FX's Grotesquerie premieres September 25th on FX. Stream on Hulu. All right, so I'm just going to say it. Episodes six through nine of this podcast accomplish so much, so many things, and there's so much to talk about in terms of content. Episode seven is an episode in which I heard one of the most upsetting things in my life, which was an expert for the defense who, in a complete misinterpretation of Sharia law that nobody agrees with, including people in Iraq, including experts on Sharia law in the West, including everyone. But the and this expert stands by this assertion to this day that the testimony of women has half the value of the testimony and assertions of men. If I was told that in my testimony is worth half of that of a man, and that's the world I grow up in, I would not believe that another country is going to take my word one for one, that I'm not going to be able to speak with my voice in clarity. So I don't know if those five women if one of them has a different version of the facts, but wouldn't speak it out because they have to be collectively with other people because they, I think that they're being manipulated into a narrative. Laura Bricker, thoughts? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I was getting ready for this because everyone that had listened to it was like, your head is going to explode. (laughs) I died. When you hear this episode, I guess I wasn't as shocked as I thought I was going to be probably because everyone prepared me for it, but I was also just like, so I'm listening to this and I'm like, So basically what they're saying is two women's testimony equals one man's testimony. And then when they go to ask this, you know, kind of follow up. And then it's like, but because of that, that means women just are going to lie because like people know that they don't believe them. And so this is another reason why we're not going to believe women, because of course they're going to lie if if they're only worth 50 percent of like the men's testimony and then the guy tries to like really downplay it when they go talk to him now. Like, well, I was, that was, I was a lot younger then. And that was a like a while ago. And like, you know, do, 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 do. Didn't someone else call but, him dipshit but later? But then they went and talked to essentially yeah. the judge in the case. No, that was the dipshit. Yeah. Uh, and they basically talked to the judge in the case. Uh, who, I'll call him the judge, even though that's not technically what he's called. And he was the one who made the assertion that this is why women lie. Because they know their yeah, testimony. Yeah, and then he was like, and we just don't believe them. We just, and then we don't believe these family. So you're like, you don't believe the family. No, we, we don't believe these family members. And and I'm sorry, I can see that you've been like, what did he say? Like, you've been drinking the Kool-Aid or you believe this because you're like naive. at what, And I'm like, oh my God, you're telling that. Asshole. You're telling a woman naive. And I'm like, Wah! it continued. And it was just one of those things that I felt like, it's 2024 now. This was in what, 2000 and Doesn't matter. Six? Doesn't matter yeah. when it was. Uh, well, I, th- this is what I'm saying is like, I guess part of me is like this type of belief is out there at this time in history. And this is the sort of thing I, you know, want to call out on every level and like punch people in the face, but I wouldn't do that because I can't punch. But the fact that it just perpetuated why these families were not taken seriously as they should have been at the time, because this was the belief system. And so as I'm listening to that, I'm also thinking like, you know what? So I don't know what is going to come out of this podcast. I hope something comes out of this podcast in terms of something happening. People should go to the prison people, for this. People book. should go to prison. Yeah. But the thing that did come out of this podcast, it, those families had people listening to them and interviewing them that believed them that listened to what happened to their family members, that validated their thoughts and memories in the way that they recorded them for them. And they got their say. And the people that listen to this can decide whether they think they're credible. They're fucking credible. Yeah. I'm sorry. So yes, end of my little thing. Who who is the bigger asshole? That guy or the guy who sicked his dogs on Parker during the oh door knock? Oh, God. that guy. Oh, I tell people all the time, it's the dogs I'm afraid of, not the people when that I was go an knock incredible on door knock. Door you, can, you can reason with a person. You yeah. can't reason with a mad dog, yeah. So this section with where leads to what I think is one of the most powerful scenes I've ever heard in a podcast, and I've been listening to podcasts since forever, right? Madeline has to tell these family members why this decision went the way it did. And she, through an interpreter, explains why their testimony wasn't believed. And the interpreter is so upset by having to tell them this and then by having to hear 
what the wife tells her in reaction that she basically tells Madeline, I'm going to have to translate this for you later because this is just like too much for me. Um, she was, she is so devastated. So am I just only for hearing her struggles. Just hearing about it makes me I'm sorry. It is an incredible scene. It is so moving. I can't I can't talk about it without crying. It's like it's the most astonishing like piece of journalism I've ever heard. And as you said, Laura, like if one thing comes out of this podcast for me, mm-hmm. it's that scene. It is that yeah. scene. It is like the incompetence, like the cruelty, but also like the like the like the unbelievable present day lack of reflection. You know, lack of competence, the calling as Toby, as you point out, the, 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 the way that he speaks to Samara. What were your thoughts about that scene, Toby, like her interviewing him about this case? I mean, it seems to be something that runs throughout the whole thing, right? Is that despite the fact that we're in Iraq for reasons that I think still aren't <laughs> completely clear, but the idea is we're trying to help out the Iraqi people and get them out from under Saddam Hussein's dictatorship, but we're basically trying to help them, right? That's the whole idea behind this. And yet they are treated and just considered to be so much below Americans in both sort of the worth of their life, their morality, all these things. They're so looked down upon and people are so cavalier with their lives that in addition to this all playing out in Haditha, the same thing applies to the aftermath and the way to people who are not like they're saying, well, you know, it's the fog of war or, you know, you haven't been there as you didn't under the pressure. Well, this guy where is not under this pressure. He is not in the fog of war. He has got all the time in the fucking world to kind of wrap his head around things. And he still doesn't even bother trying to understand what's going on. He still doesn't talk to anybody who has any actual knowledge of what Sharia law really means when they talk about supposedly this, like a woman is half as believable as a man or whatever, because Madeline and her team find somebody who does explain it and says that the way this guy is talking about it is freaking ridiculous. He doesn't know what language they speak. He doesn't know. Yeah. He thinks they speak Arabic and not Farsi. He seems he's troubled by the interpreter. Like he thinks that that that's a problem. He thinks they're lying to keep these payments. And I don't know whether he thinks they don't know, or he just doesn't know that actually, even if they were lying, it doesn't affect their payments at all. Like their payments are completely aside from anything they're even talking about. So anyway, it's just a long way of saying that, you know, I think there's this pervasive uh, sort of looking down on the Iraqis and, and looking them as being, I don't know if subhuman, but certainly sub-American. And it's pervasive throughout the entire, I guess, the military that we get to interact with in this podcast. And that includes Mattis. That includes this guy. That includes the people who are on the ground. That includes most of the lawyers. And when you do hear later, I think it's the guy Prentice, who is one of Charette's buddies. And he's just like, you know, I, I, I started to think about it. These are just people going about their lives. And it's like, holy fuck, dude, you're like the only person who's figured that out, that these are just people. He's the one who Charette told that he lied, right? right? He's the one, yeah. These are just people who are trying to live their lives during an occupation and just like random stuff can happen. And the reaction is, let's start killing people. And if you just happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, that's what happens. So, I mean, I think that's just one of the themes of the whole season And I think it really is like, what are we trying to accomplish? And how does this help us accomplish it? It just doesn't. Yeah, Toby, it's not just the Iraqis, just throughout military history. The othering of the enemy is important because it makes it, I don't know, easier to kill them or it gives you a reason to not see them as human. And so it isn't like we're we're marching on Germany, right? That we're like supposedly in this country to save the Iraqis. But, but that already that already makes them less than. It already makes them less than, yeah. And so it was much easier to go in and to say, yeah, I know I was a woman, I know it was a baby, but I shot them anyway. Right, I mean, I agree that dehumanizing the enemy is like, but these aren't the enemy, right? These are these are the protagonists. Exactly, you know? These are yeah. the people that we're, we're trying to save 
from Saddam Hussein, but some of them just have to die because, you know. That Prentice story is incredible. When he tells the story about going, being ordered to go to the fishing village, which is actually, quote, all like insurgents. Right, right. And then he gets there and he's like, no, it's just fishing. Fishermen? Fishing yeah. people yeah. with fishing equipment and boats. And like the, the clarity with which he tells that story, you can just see it. And he's like, we just turned around and went home. And then he talks about why he didn't testify, which was so clear and it was so reminiscent of so many things you hear, like in the criminal legal system with wrongful convictions, like why people don't do the right thing at the time and then come forward later because of pressure, you know, by prosecutors because of pressure, because of deals and so forth. Like it's just the clarity is just there. But this is this whole other layer there about military stuff and, uh, you know, a military justice system and stuff. So, Kevin, that we do hear, I mean, talk about the things that these episodes accomplish. There's the whole data journalism aspect mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where they bring Which in is Will also on the New Yorker website, it's by on the, the way. Yep. Website, and Will Craft did some of that work. He worked on it in the, in the dark season, too, with the Doug Evans uh, data around mm -hmm. uh, keeping black people off of juries. So we hear that he did some of the work on this. Um, and then, you know, so they put a whole database together of previously unreported military crimes. By again, and Toby, this is why I think they're such a good match for The New Yorker, because I don't discern any difference in writing quality and podcasting quality, but I do discern a difference in resources that they have at their disposal. Being able to sue the military again and again and again and again and again and have the time to do that and be able to like get these materials to make that is astonishing. So that's something they accomplish. But the question you have, Kevin, is the makeup of the military courtroom, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, in the dark has been a, a you know about quite literally shining light in the dark corners of different systems and this time we're looking at the military justice system which is where we finally arrive uh, narratively in the in the series and I was just really thinking about the difference between a military prosecution and a civilian prosecution and like well the manners in which like deals were cut and charges for cooperators were dropped seemed very much like a civilian criminal case right but also you have to think about the jury makeup considerations, like all the members of the jury, or I guess they're called the members or whatever the nomenclature is, that they were Marines, but not just Marines, they were combat Marines, right? They weren't lawyers. They weren't like people that had knowledge of the law. Yeah. Well, I mean, like in a, but a jury of your peers, right? To be super selected. This is like putting a, a police officer on trial. For misconduct and the jury is all patrolmen. Yep. Right. right. So you're like, oh, well, they really know what's going on. But like, you know, is that like putting your thumb on the scale of justice there? I mean, I think like for the prosecution, the only place seemed to be like to appeal to their sense of conduct unbecoming, like in a few good men. Right, like you're Marines and you're supposed to do that. Like either you're doing that. So let's or take the victims' names off of the. So let's take right, right, which right. is so fucked up. Yeah, or they, I mean, the other thing might be like again, I probably would have thought a little more that like some of the combat veterans, like we heard with the seals in the line, that they once they do kill someone, they go home and cry about it. Right, it isn't just there are the sociopaths, like they are fine with that. But real human emotions come out and people will struggle with the fact that they needed to do that. And like that why might have been one thing to play on the jury. We'll just never know because they cut a deal before they even got there. But it just seemed like in the military justice system, this is one of the reasons why very few soldiers and sailors go to jail. Yeah. Because the people they're trying, especially for combat stuff, if they've been in combat, they're like, well, I get it, man. I get it. Sometimes a baby just jumps out of a fucking house and you got to take care of business, yeah. you know? Well, with the deal, the thing that I found really annoying about that mm -hmm. was it's like, okay, we're going to drop everything about all the, the other people who there because we're going to go for the kingpin. We're going to go for the commander. I'm like, this isn't like trying to take down the kingpin in a drug operation. Mm -hmm. It's not like we're going to go to the kingpin and we're going to cut off the supply of drugs. We'll work our like, way up to the oh, general, Laura. Yeah, yeah. I'm like- no, that logic did not apply the same way that it would in a case where you'd be like, okay, if you cooperate, you get this because mm -hmm. we really want that guy. Because mm -hmm. the crime will no. stop then. No, <laughs> no, no. No, I, I agree. And the fact that they got the guy who made the deal and then he looked at his own deal and realized how shitty it was. That was also an incredible scene. Another incredible fucking scene where he's just waiting. He's like, oh, I, if only I see my deal, I know that I'll like it. Like I like that was a set that was essentially it. Like I know I'll be okay with my deal. Like I remember there's something there that was actually pretty good. And then Samara's like, I got you your precious document. 
Well, the way she said that too, she's like, I got it for you. And she wasn't being condescending, I don't think. She was like, I got it for you. And then he opens it and he's like, oh, fuck. Like, this isn't good. This is real bad. Man, I just kicking myself because you brought up how did we wind up giving Ted him immunity? It's like, man, why did I let trial counsel let me do that? My God. You know, just like, why did I let them talk me into that? Ugh. So surprise, Toby, in the final episode of the series, they not only identify, but solve a whole other previously unknown murder that's tied to this war crime. The, the reported number has always been 24. They figure out it's actually 25. They identify the victim. They figure out what happened to the victim. They're able to tell the victim's family what happened to the victim, uh, find out where the body is, and then bring resolution to that family and like really bring an entire new story beginning to end full circle in a single episode. I was completely bowled over by that. Like for some podcasts, that would be the whole series and this team did this in one episode and that you know that that was a whole other like tranche of reporting. What did you think about the final episode of, of the season, Toby? Yeah. So it felt a little bit like a standalone mm-hmm. to me. I mean, it's it sort of they tie up the one narrative in like the big narrative, I guess, at the end of episode eight, although there's like a wrap up at the end of episode nine and episode nine is really following a guy who was killed, which starts off. When Wooderich sees a couple of dudes walking like a couple hundred yards away and just decides to shoot at them. So they run as you would. And then they happen to run into more Marines who are like, oh, look at these guys. They're running away. There must be something so fucked suspicious. up. Let's shoot one of them in the head. So it's sort of adjacent to these other things, although it's, a, it's an entirely sort of different story. And this seemed to be more like a process type episode where it's like, this is what we did to figure it out, right? There's this story that's fairly short, what we know about it. And then we know this guy got airlifted to Baghdad. He was going to get airlifted somewhere else and somewhere between Baghdad and this other place he died. But then you sort of see how they go and they figure out how they can possibly identify him. It turns out this morgue was taking pictures of everybody because they couldn't identify anybody and thought- smart. When things kind of calm down, maybe they could try and start making a reckoning. So, yeah. And and again, it was, you know, the ending of it's very moving when they're able to tell this person's relatives that, you know, we found we found out what happened. We found where he is. Military never told them. Yeah. So, I mean, it was it was an excellent episode. When I was listening to it, I was like, would it have made sense to integrate it a little bit more into the rest of the story rather than just kind of like stick it on at the end? But in the end, I think it probably would have been confusing and just hard to follow. So I think they made the right decision yep. on that, even if it does seem a little bit like, oh, and then, then this also happened. But that story in and of itself is super interesting and it doesn't feel like filler or just like, oh, this is this other shit we did. So we're just going to throw it on there because we've got it. You know, it does kind of point to the peril, right? Like even the people who sort of escaped Uderich and his like insanity like just ran into another place right. where they were mm. in danger. Yep. And the military did nothing to tell the family. Did nothing. One thing I feel kind of conflicted at the end of this is like the where is this going to go? Like you hope something's going to happen. These families that have shared their stories about their loved ones being killed. But I think including this other story in there. Okay, here's a story that has some resolution. There's a story where we are able to figure out what happened, get it to the families so there is an ending Whereas the other stories where we have the, the rest of the Haditha situation, like, I hope something fucking happens. I hope somebody goes to like is held accountable, but I, I, I don't feel like optimistic for that. So I felt like ha- having this other story where you felt like, okay, and then tying it back to the main story and reminding everybody that, yeah, they're people. Because I think that was one of the details in this. that just really kicked me in the gut was the, we're just numbers now. And Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm reminded in one of the scenes here about like how great they are with the way they present their audio, that they're very restrained as far and like letting stuff kind of play out in important moments. There was this one sort of like for me, sort of like really heart stopping moment in this final episode when Samara is giving the brothers information and Minat is there translating and they get to the part where like he translates and tells the brothers that Mamdu is dead. You can hear 
them holding back the sobs. And then there's like, all of a sudden there's this building flurry of the men talking loud and fast. You have no idea what this emotion is because you're thinking it's angry. It's hard to interpret what, I mean, you don't understand the language, but it's also kind of hard to interpret the tone. And, it, and they kind of left this alone to play. In the end, they were just very grateful. Um, you know, Samara was sort of like saying, in essence, like, I'm sorry I had to be the one to tell you that. And, and and they're like, no, 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 we're very grateful that you did. But the way it played out in real life just was like so riveting. And, you know, as a listener there, all of a sudden I was like, like really taken aback. يعني مو حلوة وليست طيبة حتى أنقلها لكم. لا والله. بس كانت أشعر إنه لازم تعرف. لا والله هسه بالعكس راحتنا مو ما يتحنا الموت. نحن راضين قدر رب العالمين قدره بس. الحمد لله. ارتحنا بس واحد نعرف. This is his fate and we are really really appreciate you uh, telling us what happened to him. Not only are they doing stuff and finding a way to sort of make a real life difference in this journalism, but also just. The way that they present it is so superior. So final thought that I have, and I just want to get your reactions to this. What did y'all think when you heard that Meriden, Connecticut has a Frank Wooderich Day? The hell. Uh, in honor of this man that lots of money has been raised to support him. Who wants to respond to that? I, I was driving. I was driving up to the northern regions of Vermont through the mountains when this particular scene came on. And I just like went... I like screamed and I'm like, it's a good thing. There's nobody else around. Cause I'm in the middle of nowhere. Like, are you kidding me? And I'm like, the disconnect is so startling to me that I, I just couldn't, I was like, you've got to be fucking kidding me. And then I'm like, who are the people that thought this was a good idea? No, no. I would like a Toby ball day, a Rebecca Lavoie day. Mm. I do not want a fucking Frank Wooderich day. What about a Kevin like Flynn guy? That's there. kind of a death. Kevin Flynn yeah, don't forget I'm Kevin sorry. Flynn. Yeah. Kevin That's Flynn. All right. How about a Kevin Madeline Fl- Barron? Some oh, yeah. Yeah. Madeline Mark Barron day. Parker, yes. 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 Yeah. I would have an in the and dark day. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just kind of in keeping with the mindset that got the whole thing where it is, right? It's, it's sort of, it's a dominance mindset. Yep. And who knows what the people who are raising money for it and bringing it up, what they actually knew about what had happened. Like, who, yep. who knows what kind of. Is, it may have just been like, oh, yeah, he was at the Battle of Haditha. He came back. You know, he was in charge of stuff. You know who knows what happened? Frank Ruderich. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't come off as being very self-reflective. Like even his no, he doesn't. even his <laughs> lawyer is just kind of like, well, yeah, I, you know, I didn't really have much of a connection with him, but he certainly seemed confident in himself. But, yeah. you know, I mean, he certainly was troubled and it kind of you kind of wonder, did he go into the military that way or did he come out that way or both? I think that like anything, I feel like the military to some degree, like let's think about Bo Bergdahl, they they attract people that might have already some challenges in some regards. And this is this is a place where they, you know, for whatever reason are attracted. You know what I mean? Like I think there's there is something to be said for that. Well, you just got so many people too. I mean, just the the odds yeah. are gonna be that you know, you don't have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people and not have the wide variety of you know, issues and lack of issues and stuff. But but you you're you're attracting people that to some degree are going to be have to be capable of violence if they're in war, if they're in a situation that's a life or death situation that they have to so that you're attracting a certain type of personality. It is a psychopathic culture, is what we hear in this podcast. It is a right. psychopathic culture that is like, especially in this instance, absolutely rewarded, absolutely encouraged, and nothing happens when you do the very worst to human beings. It's easy to train someone to kill. It's hard to train them about what to do afterwards or to exercise proper judgment in all cases with that power. Good taste is easy to spot, but hard to pin down. You know it when you see it. And in today's culture, there's no greater signifier of taste than the car you drive. You want something sophisticated, but not stodgy. Daring, yet classic. Approachable, but with an air of opulence. It may sound like a rare find, because it is. And it perfectly describes the Range Rover Evoque. Drive a statement piece with pure presence. The Evoque is charisma in motion. This luxury SUV is artfully crafted and designed to stand out. And the reductive exterior is an elegant expression of Range Rover DNA. With clean lines, the minimalist design speaks for itself. The chisel taillights give it a sense of motion. Even at standstill, you'll find quality materials and solid craftsmanship at every turn. And you can curate your interior with a variety of distinct themes and trim finishes. 
It's an elevated drive for elevated lives. Explore the Range Rover Evoque at LandRoverUSA.com. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success, so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagina tu futuro de otra manera en capella.edu. This episode is supported by FX's Grotesquerie, a new series from executive producer Ryan Murphy. Heinous crimes unsettle a small community, and the local detective feels these atrocities are eerily personal, as if someone or something is taunting her. Starring Nisi Nash Betts, Courtney B. Vance, Leslie Manville, and Travis Kelsey. FX's Grotesquerie premieres September 25th on FX. Stream on Hulu. If your child is struggling in school, then IXL is right for your family. IXL is an online learning program for kids that covers math, language arts, science, and social studies. Backed by research, kids using IXL are scoring higher on tests. It's no wonder it's used in 95% of the top 100 school districts in the U.S. Plus, a month of IXL costs less than an hour of tutoring. Get an exclusive 20% off IXL membership when you sign up today at IXL.com slash 20. Visit IXL.com slash 20 to get the most effective learning program out there at the best price. All right, let's do what we do. Let's let our listeners know, should they listen to In the Dark Season 3? We've now finished the entire season. Laura Bricker, thumbs up or thumbs down for In the Dark Season 3. Yeah, um, you know, no shocker here. This is a big thumbs up. This is a must listen. I think that this story was um, rage inducing, heartbreaking, maddening, extremely well reported and researched, um, very enlightening very thorough. I mean, I I could go on and on, but it brought to the surface a very detailed and and very, you know, thoughtful look at this whole case and this issue. They went and talked to every single person that they could. They got all those documents. They sued the U.S. government. You know, if you want to know the whole story, you know the whole story now. I just hope something happens because you can't listen to this and not be somewhat dumbfounded and also just horrified that nobody was held accountable for these murders. Toby Ball, thumbs up or thumbs down for In the Dark Season 3. So like all the stuff that we usually, you know, critique podcasts on, you know, writing, production, reporting, you know, narration, all, all this stuff, like all that's just like A plus level, right? So I think what kind of sets this apart a little bit is, or not a little bit, but quite a bit is the subject matter, the sort of troubling and, you know, I hate to use the word profound, but I think it, it it's kind of apt in a lot of ways, questions about the way our military operates, particularly in situations in which it should not necessarily be adversarial when our military that you know, our tax dollars go to support are around civilians that we're supposed to be helping the fact that, and again, like a lot of organizations, but the the concern at all times seemed to be not with maintaining the discipline and sort of uh, stated values of the military, but instead just protecting people who are within the military from having any consequences to their actions. I, I think last time when we did the first five episodes. My thought was, you know, it seems that if you're going to have rules of war, you should like hold people accountable to following them. And if having these rules doesn't work for actual instances of war, that's a whole different conversation that we have to have is like, do we want to have these or is it really just a sort of no holds barred situation? And if that is in fact the case, how do we react when other people use the same things. I mean, I think there's just a lot of questions that kind of come out of this. So anyway, I mean, it's, you know, I I think it was hard to top uh, season two of in the dark. I think it's sort of gone down as one of the sort of legendary seasons of, uh, of podcasting. I, I think this does. I just think this is a bigger societal story. And I think it holds more powerful people up to the light to show uh, what was sort of behind decisions that were made. 
So anyway, I think you probably got the point by now that it's a thumbs up. Kevin Flynn. Kevin Flynn. <laughs> thumbs up or thumbs down for In the Dark Season 3. I said this before that there is a better journalist out there than Madeline Barron, but I don't know who that is. And there is a better podcast series doing investigative journalism than In the Dark, but I haven't heard it. This is just an incredible achievement of journalism, of the time put in. For all of the people that were interviewed who were like, I don't see the purpose or what's to be gained from this investigative journalism thing. It's important work and it's very hard. And I don't think anything is going to happen from this. I don't think anyone's going to the break. The best thing that can happen is that Mom Do's family has some answers and that the people that were involved, their, these families, their stories were heard again. But the point of the whole podcast is that something could have been done to hold people accountable and nothing happened. And that's what's outraging. So thank you, Madeline, Samara, Parker, and everybody else at The New Yorker for saving this podcast, for presenting this. The work that you do is important, and I'm glad you got to share it with the world. Don't forget Raymond Tungakar. Sure. Yeah, Raymond, <laughs> all the other, so Crafter, at the Daniel risk of, of, of leaving somebody out, it's yeah. just, it's, um, it's, <clears throat> it's an achievement. Yeah. So here's how I feel about this podcast. Uh, it's perfectly delivered. It's perfectly written. It is so compelling, so listenable. Uh, you know, and the thing about season two, people listen to it now. It's going to feel very long and very protracted because there were so many update episodes. Like it doesn't feel like, you know, a beginning and end kind of season because it kind of went on and on and on as the story unfolded. That was just the nature of it. I think season one of In the Dark is actually really underrated in retrospect. I re-listened to it again recently. It is fucking excellent it really does take a look at policing in a completely different angle than we have ever heard before or since uh in terms of like accountability about solving we haven't heard that since in a way that we heard it on that podcast and i think about it all the time and it is excellent i haven't heard anything like this before i've heard podcasts say they're going to do something like this before. Uh, look at a military story from a big zoom out perspective or a big, you know, accountability perspective. I have never seen a piece of reporting accomplish this much in one project in the history of my looking at pieces of journalism. So the data journalism, the secrets revealed the stories told from beginning to end with new interviews that were considered to be unobtainable, uh, new materials that were considered to be heretofore unobtainable, places that were considered to be impossible to go, voices that were considered to be impossible to get on tape, and then just the beauty of the storytelling itself. This is something like, unlike I've ever heard before. It is Absolutely astonishing. So yeah, thumbs down for season two. <laughs> absolutely thumbs No, absolutely thumbs up. This is just an achievement. It's an achievement. It's it's gorgeous. And it's honestly a super good listen. Like it's a good fucking listen. Like you will like listening to it. It's an entertaining, good listen. So yeah, huge thumbs up. If anyone beats this for podcast of the year, like I don't know who's gonna be it. And I, I just I I finished listening to this and I'm like, dude, podcasters everywhere. I kind of want to encourage you to hang up your mics because you're never going to outdo this one. Yeah, big thumbs up for season three of In the Dark. All right, that's going to do it for us. But before we go, Lara Bricker, a lot of like big shoes to follow, I know. But do we have a cat of the week this week? We have some cats. Oh, good. These come to us from Bethany Vogler Stay, one of our podcast listeners in, hold on for it, Ottawa. Ooh, Bethany writes, hey, Laura, Ottawa-based super fan. Also like your books? I'm rereading this cozy season. And for Crime Writers On, for many years, going back to 2014, Bethany. What? I, mm. I know. I wanted to submit a cat slash kittens of the week. Our family is fostering four kittens, Nova, Oreo, Fluffy, and Dog. They are full of energy, love to play when they aren't eating or napping. And thank you for your consideration. I'm looking forward to tomorrow's episode. Bethany and family. And look at these little kittens. Oh my God, they're so cute. They're all playing with their little kitten toys. There is one picture of them all together. It was very hard because they were running around. So Bethany, 
four kittens, I would I would not be able to get rid of them if I was fostering them. So good for you. It would be a foster <laughs> fail for you. Is that I what you're trying to say? I would be a foster fail. I would be a foster fail. So um, Bethany, I wait for the final report from you as to how these kittens make out. All right. Of course, folks can send us their animal nominations to be pet of the week. They can be any kind of animal to crimeraders on at gmail.com. But if they want to reach out to you directly, Laura Bricker, how can you be found on social media? Um, they can find me at Laura Bricker on Instagram and Twitter. Tell you, ball folks want to find out what's coming up on the latest episodes of Rip Current. How can they find you on social media? I'm at Toby Ball and H. If you're so inclined and you listen to Rip Current and want to leave a rating and or a review, that's super helpful. That really helps with the algorithm, makes it more discoverable. Also, uh, more like Ancient Failions is on uh, <laughs> is on Amber's podcast network. Uh, more grab like bag Ancient collab. Failions. Yeah, more like Ancient <laughs> Failions. So you can check that out too. Kevin Flynn, how can you be found? I'm a Kevin P. Flynn. I'm at Reb Lavoy everywhere. You can talk to me about anything you want, as long as you're not an asshole. Join us on our Facebook group. Just go to Facebook, find Crime Raiders on. There's directions there on how to join the group. You literally just have to know one of our names. Everybody there is rad. Get all the stuff we make on Patreon at patreon.com slash, what is it, Kevin? I don't know. Laura, what is it? It is patreon.com slash partners in crime media. That's Great. right. Our theme song Toby, is com- what's the, the music that we play during the yeah. business section? Who wrote that, Toby? It goes blink, 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 like that one. Yeah, <laughs> but who but who wrote our theme song, Toby? Uh, the very handsome Livy Burdett. No, that's our editor. Who wrote our theme song? <laughs> um, the New York Ska Jaws Ensemble? No, Jesus Christ. I'm going to put everybody out of their misery. That was misery. years ago. It's Ty Gibbons. Oh, our yeah, line Ty editor is the excellent <laughs> Livy Burdett. The executive producer is Kevin Flynn. This show was recorded in Studio C, the closet in our Hampshire basement, where we promise not to sick our dogs on you if you knock unexpectedly on our door. I can't promise that. On behalf of all the crime writers... Thanks so much for listening. We will catch you later. later. I I feel like it's one of those things where if we had a trivia contest about our show and it was a <laughs> bunch of strangers, I would still probably not have you not would, place. No, you would lose all. You would lose all of yeah. it. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. With Capella University's game-changing FlexPath learning format, you gain relevant skills you can apply to your career right away. Earn your degree from an accredited university and be confident in the quality of your education. Imagina tu futuro de otra manera en capella.edu. Capella University is accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. Learn more at capella.edu accreditation.